How would you like to spend less time on payroll? How would you like to improve your client experience? How would you like to be a hero to your client's understaffed HR and IT functions? How would you like to get your clients discounts on apps like Slack, Zoom, or Dropbox? How would you like a $100 Amazon gift card? Stay tuned to learn more from our sponsor, Rippling, later in the episode. CAS practices saw a 20% growth rate in terms of net client fees per professional. And that's far greater than the 12% growth rate that CAS practices reported in 2018. 20% is very fast in accounting. CAS is probably growing faster than anything other than consulting. Net client fees for overall CAS practices on average have exceeded a million dollars now. So this is among all respondents. So small firms, big firms, right? So that's, that's important, I think, psychologically for a practice, a CAS practice inside of a firm to exceed a million dollars. That's psychologically important. Today is Saturday, October 16th. This is the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. David, you're back from Cancun. Back from Cancun, back to reality. How was your trip? Landed in last night. It was good. Uh, it was first time doing all-inclusive. Where'd you stay? We were at the Hyatt Solara. All-inclusive. So uh, that del- means... Yeah, it was uh, uh, ad- uh, adults only. Adults only. All- nice. All-inclusive. But, you know, I was thinking about, that we were talking about, like, oh, Intuit should have an all-you-can-eat, right? Where we talk about the subscription economy, right? And can yeah. firms do this? Because really, that's what this is, right? It's an all-you-can-eat all for a fixed fee. Fixed fee. So was it per night that you paid? I'm not sure it was the whole trip. Got it. Book. Yeah, I, I don't know. But okay. so you have, you know, unlimited free drinks, the unlimited meals. It's not the greatest food in the world, but like their buffet is better than any hotel buffet I've been at. And then you you get decent food. It's high quality food. But if you wanted the tomahawk steak or if you wanted the lobster, if you wanted to have a cabana that was direct access to the pool, right? Or if you want the cabana that's on the beach with the best view, you pay a premium for those things. Okay, so food is included, drinks are included. I mean, I didn't expect there was going to be like upsells. So, so that's the thing that when I was researching this for myself, I almost didn't like that because then I felt like, okay, well, how, I still don't really know how much it's going to cost. But I guess the upsells, you get there and you're like, uh, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do, the, I'll do the extra activity that's a premium activity or the premium cabana. But the idea is that everything that you might want normal is, is included. Well, you have and, to have that expectation, right? Uh, like yeah. you did not know that was going to happen. Yeah. And so if you if you go to a sub, a subscription model, all you can eat type model for your clients, for you your need firm. to be very clear about the things you might charge extra for. Right. Like, oh, and, you want your statements? You want twenty four hour responses instead of forty eight hour responses? Those types of things has to be very clear. You're going to charge extra for those things. And with that said, yeah, I still bought the like the the water experience and the massage package and the. Okay, so you did for, take the upsell opportunity. I did take an upsell opportunity. Yes, I did take advantage of that. Um, but I was also thinking, like, if they can figure out how to do this and make it profitable, there's no reason a firm can't figure this out with their clients. I, I'm, because, I'm sure it's very profitable. But but it's, and it's very yeah. dynamic, right? You don't know how much this guy's going to drink versus this person's going to drink or how much food this person's going to eat from the buffet or how many people are going to do the upgrade. And I was actually thinking about the upgrades, like to have lobster and steak dinner on the beach under a nice little tent, the whole thing. It's like yeah, 250 yeah. bucks. No, no, and this is all like newlyweds anniversaries. That's all who's there. Nobody, t- nobody bought it. Nobody was out there ever taking advantage of this. And this is where you can price it in a way to where you don't want people to take advantage of that extra <laughs> service. Or if they right. do, you have it really buffered in for it. So it's extremely profitable. And for those people, if they really want some nice steak dinner, they'll just leave the property and go buy it somewhere else for half that price, which now means you, you don't have any, any cost associated with that person eating. Right. The other dinners that night. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's an interesting model to kind of think about how you can apply it to your practice. And the other big takeaway I think I saw was they're all about the reviews. They have every single person, every single person you interact with, obviously top-notch service across the board, but they all mention, they make sure you know their name and they all mention how, please you know use my name when you write the review, TripAdvisor, write the review on Google, wherever it's at, right? Because it's obviously they're getting spiffed or getting bonuses and their performance is dependent on the reviews they get the clients to write. Mm, mm-hmm. And so, and then it's very obvious they, uh, 
their bonus structure is set up that way. And, and that could be the same thing with your firm, right? If you could shift the focus of your employees to just making co- customers happy. And positive customer reviews is a key metric, not the right. hours they bill. <laughs> yeah. Right. And that goes, yeah. to, but we, it goes back to two weeks ago. We talked about this, like the motivations, yeah. right? They're motivated to give good service and ask you for review and have you put their name in the review. They make sure they're memorable. You, you basically, they're making sure you have a memorable experience so that you remember their name when you put it in the review. It's and a good like, incentive. That's a People yeah. should do that with their firm employees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. But well, overall, great. It's, it's great. And then you, you well, know, you land back in the U.S. and you have to go back through, uh, you know, customs and, you know, you go back through our TSA again. And it's right back to, yeah. you just, all oh, that customer service is just gone. It's just gone. <laughs> Welcome back to the U.S. A guy told somebody, like, hurry up in the line. I'm like, well, oh boy. Yeah, I guess uh, we're back. I'm really glad you brought this up because fixed fees used to be the big debate. It was the the debate between do I bill my clients hourly or do I bill them a fixed fee? And we have basically settled that debate. The majority has moved to some form of fixed fee billing. Even if it's based on hours to calculate that price, we still fix the price. And even if we give them a range, we're real, if you give somebody a range of hours you're going to bill them, that's a fixed fee anyway. It's just a loose fixed fee. That debate is over. The next great frontier for firms is what you have described, which is a very loose scope or a broader scope, which is the all you can eat, the all inclusive subscription package on a fixed fee. I think Ron Baker is calling it the um, pricing the the relationship. Pricing the relationship, yes. And I, I'm really bought into this. I've actually been using this in my consulting practice. For your Porsche? Oh, oh, I thought so, this was for your your Porsche. <laughs> you're, you're on the Porsche model, and you get a new Porsche anytime you want. No, are you kidding, man? I'm an accountant. I have a Honda Civic that I'm going to drive to two hundred thousand miles. <laughs> That's how I operate. Got it. Got it. You know, I'm not paying for, I'm not paying, a, I don't know what that is, but I think, I it's, think like, it's four to 500 bucks a month. And you can, oh, it's got to be, no, it's got to be more than you that. want. No, I mean, because like a Lexus is like 500 a month. A Porsche, it's got to be like a thousand or more. I, I, I can't think it's imagine. 4,600. Oh, 4,600. Oh, geez. Yeah. Christ. And you just, you just, anytime <laughs> you like, oh, that's like double just, my, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. You're going to the soccer game. You just, you swap it out for a bigger SUV Porsche. You're, right, right. It's just it's you and your wife taking a road trip, you get the small one. You just swap it out anytime you want. Right. So that's an extreme example of the all-inclusive plan. But yeah, like for firms, I think there's a big advantage if you can figure out how to do it in offering a basic set of services the way these hotels do, where you get all the food, all the drinks, the lodging, it's all inclusive. And the basic was good. And, it was really, it's outstanding. It's great. Right. Right. There, I have no complaints about the basic service. So for a firm, what would that look like? That might mean we do your bookkeeping, we do your taxes, we give you basic tax planning, and that's all inclusive. And we don't track our time. We don't bill you for time. We're not going to also, we're not going to worry about how many bills you have or how many employees you have on payroll. We're, we're just going to include all of this, you know, up to a certain amount. Oh yeah. Payroll would be in there. Paying their bills would be in there. If you ask me, just acting as their outsourced accounting department. I think it could be done and it could be done really well. And if the hotel, if the hospitality industry has figured out how to do this, I mean, that's complex. There's a lot that goes into that. Then I think accountants can do it too, for sure. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Client Hub. Do you struggle to get answers from clients? Is it a chore reminding your clients to send over the information you need to do your job? Introducing Client Hub, an award-winning practice management solution for accountants looking to build better client relationships for a more profitable firm. Client Hub's all-in-one solution combines task management with client communication in one place, meaning you get what you need from clients to unblock workflow and get jobs completed on time. Your clients will love the easy-to-use Client Hub web portal and mobile app. Your team will love Client Hub's automated task management. Each month, Client Hub tasks your clients with whatever you need from them. You can even automatically ask your clients about uncategorized QuickBooks transactions. With Client Hub, tasks and messages are in one place, keeping your staff and clients always in the loop. Nothing falls through the cracks. Client Hub currently has an amazing offer just for our listeners 25% off your first three months by using promo code CAP25. Head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash clienthub. 
That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash C-L-I-E-N-T-H-U-B. Thanks for that story. I have my own vacation story. Did you take a vacation last week as well? No, I didn't. Well, I did a staycation yesterday. That counts. My parents are, uh, we call them rainbirds. They're back in town now that Phoenix is paradise. So they came back into town and they took my son for a couple nights. So my wife and I had the the day off. We took PTO yesterday, or she did. I mean, I'm self-employed now, so I can do whatever I want, right? <laughs> so uh, we took the day off and we did something I've been really wanting to do for a really long time, which is go to Taliesin West. Does that name ring a bell, David? If it's, not- uh, It's the uh, commune, right? They make- um... <laughs> Oh, no, no. This is the Frank Lloyd Wright property, right? Yes. That's right. So, so, right. so Frank Lloyd Wright, one of the- You the other part, so I look really smart. <laughs> well, it kind of was a commune, though. So let me explain this. So Frank Lloyd Wright was one of the great architects. Some people would consider him the greatest architect who ever lived. When I moved to Scottsdale, one of the things I learned that was really cool was that Frank Lloyd Wright has a house here. I could hike there from my house. It's in the same, basically the same neighborhood, or at least one over. It's a 10-minute drive. Talies and West is the, the house he built here, the school he built in Arizona, in Scottsdale, because his doctor toward the end of his life said, you can't stay here in the winter. It's killing your lungs. And so he, he moved here, and he selected a site. This was when Phoenix was very small. Scottsdale, North Scottsdale didn't even exist, so he was out in the middle of a ranch. And he found this site on the on the slope of a mountain and started building Talies and West. And he had a, an architecture school and he brought all of his students for half the year. They all came out here and they basically camped in the desert and started building Talies and West, brick by brick, by hand. Here's the tie-in. So I went to visit Talies and West, so I did the tour. And, and one of the things I learned on the tour is that Frank Lloyd Wright had a really unusual philosophy about education. He said that education should be learning by doing. And this is why he had the students come to the school and actually build the school. They built his house. I mean, that's kind of a side benefit, isn't it? You know, he got free labor to build his house, but he also taught them a lot doing it. And so they would help design it and draft it and then build it by hand. And he said that you cannot learn architecture and design sitting at a drafting table. That's important. You have to do that, but if you you can't just learn it in a classroom or, or in an office. You have to actually build something with your hands. And I think, David, you might like that as somebody who grew up in a construction family, right? Like well, you well, probably learned a ton. Because right? you, you feel a sense of accomplishment, right? Yeah. Which is some a lot of us suffer from, I think, at our current roles. But what the, the good thing about this is, and this is why you can really see it in his work, he always used materials. In the I mean, local different, area, yeah. Right? And, he, and that's what made his architecture so great is his use of raw materials and how he kept them exposed in their almost mm-hmm. rawest form. But he only did that because he touched them, right? Like you couldn't yeah. just draw that up. The houses that he builds, the the buildings that he, he designed, they seem to rise up out of the landscape organically. And he very much believed that architecture should uh, reflect nature. And so by using the materials where he was building and actually taking the rocks. They, the way they built the walls for Taliesin is they took the rocks from that place that they were excavating, right, to flatten out and build the house. They took the rocks and then they, they glued them together with concrete. And that's the walls of the house. It's literally taking the rocks that are there and building walls. So it seems very like it fits in. But back to the learning by doing thing, I think that accounting suffers from the opposite. We were talking about accounting education. I believe that the biggest threat to the future of our profession is that education and accounting has not kept up with the change in the profession, like with technology. And one of the reasons that we suffer is that accounting students go through four years of a bachelor's, and then they have to do this extra year of education to sit for the CPA exam. Then they spend about a year studying for the CPA exam. And after all of that, they still don't know how to do accounting. You couldn't take a graduate, even somebody who has studied for the CPA exam and passed it, and drop them into an audit and expect them to know what they're doing. You know, I I I did very well on audit because it was the first section of the exam that I took. I got, I think I got like a 96. 
was 96 or 97. I can't remember. Let's say it's 96 because I was uh, terrified I wouldn't you know, pass. So I, I just studied and studied and studied. I got a 96 on audit, my best section. I, I have no clue how to do an audit. It's all theoretical. <laughs> like you, if you asked me to, hey, Blake, can you please audit my books for your company, right? Sombrero Apps Company. I couldn't do it. I wouldn't know where to start. I know the theory. I know all the terms and all that stuff, but I don't know how to actually do it. And I always thought that was really weird. <laughs> that Right? Like after you study something, shouldn't you know how to do it? And so this is the problem, which is that firms can't recruit entry-level people well, they can, but they're not set up. Most firms are not set up to train them because that takes a huge investment. And so we rely on the big four who have the resources to do that to basically train people. So not only do we have this education thing, but then we have this apprenticeship that goes on for basically five years at least if you want to get to manager. So you really actually know what you're doing. you got to spend five years there. And that's hard, right? You, they work you really, really hard to get the money back that they're investing in training you to pay your education fees, basically, right? And and so this is what's hurting us, is that when people are looking at what they should be doing with their lives, they look at accounting, and they, they see now, because of social media, just how hard they're going to have to work at the big four. These are the most talented people. They say, okay, I'm going to have to do four years of education, or five years of education, take the CPA exam, so let's give that another year. So that's six years. Uh, and then I'm going to have to go work at the big four, for at least three years, probably five, six years, if I want to make manager before I can go be a controller somewhere. Like that is not that much better than being a law student or going to medical school. Medical school is only seven years. I mean, you can be a doctor in seven years, four years of medical school, three years of residency. So like, we're not actually as competitive as we think we are. And that's why people are going into other lines of work. And I'm not even talking about the other alternative, which is go into technology, which requires very little education. Like the, if you just know what you're doing, right? You can do that. Yeah, it's, it's, we're not competitive because of that. And I think it's because our education doesn't prepare us. And so to get back to this Frank Lloyd Wright thing, we could fix this by making education much more practical in accounting. It used to be. Accounting used to be a, a um, trade, not a profession. And we made it into a profession. And then as we did that, we lost sight of the fact that you really need to learn it by doing. Like I learned accounting in the classroom, but I was also running my own bookkeeping business. So I got to practice the journal entries in real life. And so I understand debits and credits way better than anyone who just did it theoretically. And, you know, because they don't do it in practice, that's why so many accountants, so many CPAs can't really do T accounts properly, which is shocking. You know, it'd be like an architect not understanding how to pour concrete. I think you need to, as a as a designer and architect, understand how how that works in order to really build a building. <laughs> like what it's what's it actually going to look like? How's it going to work out? Are the shapes that you are designing actually going to last? It was an interesting thing to be on that tour and then to have that thought. Now, obviously, I can't let I, I can't even take a day off without thinking about our podcast. So. I can take a week off. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about the, the, the issues in, in firms. Oh, the other uh, observation I made on my vacation, you know, I wear, I like to wear Cloud Accounting podcast shirt. I'll wear my QuickBooks swim trunk some days. Nobody came up to, up to me and said, hey, I'm an accountant. And I realized because it was the 15th last week. Yeah, you, you were know, on vacation when everyone else was working. Exactly. So this yeah. week, if I would have went to the inclusive, I probably would have ran into some accountants and bookkeepers. But what did not happen the previous week? <laughs> I this heads down. Should we jump uh, into some news? Yeah, let's get into it. I mean, I think the first thing we got to talk about is where we're going this week. Sweet World, the Cloud Accounting Podcast is media at Oracle Sweet World, which runs from October 18th to the 21st in Las Vegas. I'm excited about this, David. We're going to see each other in person. In person. We'll do some recordings. If you're there, try to find us. Say hi. Let us know on social. Well, by the time this episode there. drops, it might be too late. Like, Well, if you're there and this episode <laughs> drops, go find, find us. us. Kevin O'Leary is one of the featured speakers, the Shark Tank guy. And we are interviewing Evan Goldberg, the founder and EVP of NetSuite. He's the like the original founder, guy who wrote the original version of NetSuite, I think. I'm excited about this because I do feel like I was just thinking like going back to conferences and, you know, a decade ago, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, NetSuite was kind of it when it came to cloud accounting. Everybody's kicking around, but NetSuite was the first real one, I think, that... It was the very first 
I believe this, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's been around a long time. It was the very first cloud accounting system in the United States, true SaaS. And it started out as very cheap. It was like 10 bucks a month or something ridiculous. That's hilarious now, considering that it's you know an ERP for the mid-market. Um, yeah, because I think I saw it at like CedarCon, like a QuickBooks conference, basically. Wow. Level small business accounting conference I saw it. But yeah, it's been around for a long time. So, so I'm really eager to talk to Evan about that journey. Like, how did they become an ERP system from this small business accounting system? That's very fascinating, or it should be. So we're going to talk to some customers. We're going to talk to some partners there. Uh, it should be fun. I have an article about ransomware. Big problem. Big, Big problem, problem right now. Yeah. So I know we've talked about it before, but ransomware attacks in North America rose by 158% between 2019 and 2020. But globally, they only increased... 62%. Why was it so much more here? It's That really isn't uh, listed in the article, but <laughs> the Treasury I know, Department has <laughs> I know why. some numbers. I know why. It's because the, the, the hackers are all outside the US and they're hacking, uh, they're hacking in. <laughs> yes, it, it's a We're withdrawal the big target. of money. It's like an yeah. ATM. Yeah. And, and it's just tracked, right? Because banks and financial institutions... They report to the Treasury Department. The Treasury Department can clearly see just in the first half of 2021, 600 million was distributed for ransomware payments. How much? 600 million. Wow. Was sent out. And so they released these numbers, but at the same time, they released kind of a warning. So they're issuing a warning that it fully expects organizations to take action against ransomware attacks. Like, hey, step up your security to the point where. They're telling businesses that they need to fend off these attacks and avoid paying the ransom. But if you fail, you, if, I'm sorry, but if you fail to follow this guidance, it can result in penalties and punitive action from the executive branch. So it's not good enough that you got hosed by a ransomware guy and you got to pay $50 million to get your stuff back. The treasury might tap you on the shoulder and say, now you owe us some money as a penalty. I mean, it kind of makes sense. Like, some of these recent attacks have been on critical infrastructure, like that gas pipeline on the East Coast. Yeah. I mean, imagine if like a nuclear plant gets hacked because they didn't have proper security measures in place and somebody causes a meltdown or if a water system gets contaminated. One of the proposals that I heard about was banning ransomware payments because if you take away the incentive for- Is that like the US's policy with hostages, right? But I don't think it's illegal. Like if if you're a company and one of your executives gets uh, taken hostage, you can you can pay the hostage takers, right? Like that's not illegal. Yeah, but, but I we, think the U.S. themselves won't do that. I think. Oh yeah, well we we won't, we'll do it, but it'll be like all secret, right? Okay. <laughs> I don't. I but you know you're right. The U.S. has a policy of not paying for hostages. Maybe if we as a country had a policy of not paying for ransomware attacks, then it would reduce the economic incentive. I mean, this is one of the well, arguments- The treasury could do that, right? They could block these from going out of the country. This is one of the arguments against cryptocurrency, which is that the dominant use for crypto right now, like the number one transaction, I'm pretty sure the number one reason people use it to actually pay is for ransomware. And <laughs> that's what it enables. And there was a guy, I, I can't remember this as a quote. He said, basically, like, we should ban crypto because crypto empowers ransomware. Like the whole reason that- the ransomware industry even exists is because of crypto. But so, what I don't get on this isn't this punishing the victim? If I'm walking yeah. down the sidewalk and I get stabbed, they're going to go after the guy that stabbed me, but I'm going to pay a fee too. Yeah, no, you should have been carrying your own weapon, David, and you uh, <laughs> you should have fought back. I don't know. Uh, I, yeah, I, I think that's a, it's a legit argument. Like, it's not really fair. I um, mean, yes, people. Are, but then, I mean, this goes to like just letting the market solve its own problems, right? Yeah. People are going to protect themselves. Like nobody's nobody's careless because they want to get ransomed. And and hopefully their motivation isn't like, oh, the treasury's gonna find me here. Or actually what'll happen is people will get the insurance and then the fine will never be big enough to actually make the change. Because the fine will be cheap compared to a nuclear meltdown. The fine's always gonna be cheaper. People will just do right. the math. Right. And just assume the risk. Yep. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Rippling. Rippling is more than payroll. And now that most employees are working remotely, your clients need more than just payroll. They need payroll, 
HR, benefits, and IT all working together in an all-in-one modern, flexible system. By using Rippling, when you add a new employee to payroll, you're simultaneously enrolling them in benefits, instantly setting up their email, and even sending them a computer preloaded with all the software and apps they need to do their job. Imagine how impressed your clients will be when this only takes 90 seconds. Right now, I'm sure most of you are doing just payroll, but with Rippling, you'll be able to expand the advisory work that you are offering your clients. Rippling offers a client dashboard, dedicated accountant support, and white glove migrations from other just payroll systems, as well as accountants' custom discounts on Rippling for their clients. To learn more how you can evolve your client advisory services beyond bookkeeping and just payroll, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash rippling. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash R-I-P-P-L-I-N-G. And as a bonus, for the listeners of the Cloud Accounting Podcast, Rippling is offering a $100 Amazon gift card for any listener that attends a demo. Rippling, everything your clients need. Hey, so I mentioned uh, crypto. I got to play this quote for you from Jamie Dimon, CEO at Chase Bank. He was on a webinar and he was talking about Bitcoin. I personally think that Bitcoin is worthless, but I don't want to be a spokesman. I don't care. It makes no difference to me. I don't think you should smoke cigarettes either. You know, but now it comes into like, okay, that's Jamie, now JP Morgan. I, our clients are adults. They disagree. That's what makes markets. So if they want to have access to buy or sell Bitcoin, you know, we, it's hard, we can't custody it, but we can give them legitimate, as clean as possible access. So that was Jamie Dimon talking on a webinar about, you know, crypto. And he says that he thinks Bitcoin is worthless. But he's going to let um, me buy it through my Chase Bank app? Yeah, well, because you're an adult and you're a customer and you want to buy it. So uh, Chase is going to let you do it. And he compared it to... That's the American way. Like, we let people buy anything they want. There's so much crap that's wasted a waste. He made an analogy. He said, I don't smoke marijuana, but if it were legal on the federal level, I would let people bank. I would let, like, marijuana dispensaries bank. I just think it's interesting that, you know, he's one of the holdouts. And I agree with Jamie Dimon. I think that fundamentally, I'm not willing to say it as definitively as him, but I still don't understand what the fundamental value of Bitcoin is. So I don't invest in it. It could be worthless because the, the, the whole value of it is speculative, right? And when something has mainly speculative value and it's not actually being used as a cryptocurrency or the only like use of it is, is for criminal transactions and, and ransomware payments, like I think that's a problem. If, if the pe- reason people are buying it is because it goes up. What does that remind you of, David, when, when some people are buying an asset just because it goes up? Swap it out for Beanie Babies. Yeah, or the or the housing market, right? In yeah, the, the housing market. before the financial crisis, right? And and the crazy thing is, then it was backed by an actual asset. Now we're talking about something where it's speculation that's based on uh, a, no physical asset. It's just you know code. There's nothing behind it. So I actually have thought to myself, I wonder if crypto could be the next cause of the next financial crisis. And then I saw a headline on CNBC, exactly that. Crypto could cause 2008-level meltdown, Bank of England official warns. In a speech on Wednesday, this was the, this past Wednesday, the Deputy Governor for Financial Stability at the Bank of England, John uh, Cunliffe, has warned that he warned that cryptocurrencies could spark a global financial crisis unless, unless tough regulations are introduced. The, the crypto asset market went from $16 billion 16 billion five years ago. It's 2.3 trillion today. And the subprime mortgage market in 2008 was only 1.2 trillion. You know, could this be the the next bubble that bursts? Well, I think with the housing bubble, the thing was they were selling that to pension funds and institutional type investors. I feel like a lot of the Bitcoin is not institutional. Well, now it's starting to be. Starting like, to be. And you, you, that's why this news, you know, Chase is going to take custody. Or I don't think they're going to do custo- cu- custody, but they're going to allow people to invest in it. Bigger institutions have been getting into it. Derivatives have been created. They're all buying and, it at the top. Yeah. I, I can see this. I could see this. Yes. Right? And so then you get into this. It's, it's all the derivatives thing because the more derivatives you have, the more products you have that are based on it but are not actually it, the more risk you obscure. And that's what happened in the subprime 
mortgage crisis is you had all these mortgages to people who were totally unqualified <laughs> to to hold a mortgage and super risky. And you bundle these up into different products and you give them a stamp of approval that they're not risky. And then institutions buy them and the whole house of cards eventually falls down. Yeah. That, now, so. I think that the tying this back to an old story, I mean, we've talked about this before, the, the Fed is it wants to issue their own um, coin, right? The, or digital currency, well, the, whatever, whatever this thing becomes, right? Some they're sort of thinking about it. They're thinking about digital it. Digital yeah. currency. They're doing some experiments, right? We've talked about this um, concept of the, you know, the unbanked, right? And the postal service. So the last month, the U.S. Postal Service started offering paycheck cashing services at post offices. So you have your paycheck. So instead of going to a paycheck cashing place and paying lots of fees or going to a payday lender, you go right into your post office. They'll cash your paycheck for Visa gift cards. And they're also going to offer uh, ATMs in, this, in, in the post office and bill paying services, right? This is that step of the digital banking. And look at the... Uh, um, stimulus that keeps going out to people every month, mm -hmm. right? Oh, that's like the first step towards, you know, the government distributing money. Now, will they move? Because that money is being distributed by the treasury, right? Which mm -hmm. is just another task the IRS doesn't need. So if they can outsource the distribution of this money to the post office. Yeah, yeah. And it, under the guidance of the Federal Reserve, now the Federal Reserve can inject money into the economy, pull it back whenever they want directly. The banks are removed from the picture. Yeah, and they're going straight to the people that really need that money down at the bottom because it's really going after that five percent of the unbanked. I think it's a good move. Like the the traditional banks, like look at what happened with PPP. The bottleneck was the banks, but they 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 only wanted to lend to their existing customers. They didn't want to help out new folks. They were slow. Cut them out. Screw those guys. They're just middlemen. And actually, this is the potential of blockchain: is is we don't need them to run a ledger. That's basically what a bank is. It's just a big ledger that's regulated a lot. <laughs> you could have an algorithm do it. And and we've already seen the benefit of that with international payments, right? Cutting them out. Now you're not paying 40 bucks to send a wire because of crypto. Like that's the true potential of blockchain is cutting out the middleman, not this speculative asset. So I'm critical of Bitcoin, but I'm not critical of blockchain. Blockchain is going to change the world and it's going to be crazy growth, right? So that's where I would invest. That's really interesting. I mean, I hope the Fed creates a digital digital dollar. It, it would it would solve, it would make uh, stimulus in the next crisis so much easier because you just inject money basically directly into bank accounts of US citizens. I do think it's funny because obviously, you know, the banks are going to push back and uh, the community bankers say their institutions, along with credit unions, already fill the role of reaching unbanked and underbanked. No, they don't. But obviously, they, they suck at they, that. They, they, if they're unbanked, you obviously are not reaching them. How, is yeah. that, how can you even argue this? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, and then they they offer them free checking accounts, and then they charge them thirty dollars for overdraft fees. Right? They're, yeah. they're 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 sucking the life out of them. Yeah, and that's why they're all turning to these fintechs that are also causing their own problems. But and that's actually who this is probably most disruptive to is going to be all these new fintech apps that are offering, you know, these neo banks, hey, we'll pass your paycheck, no fees. That's who this is, you know, really going to compete with. Especially for anybody that doesn't have smartphones. Right? Oh, They're going to yep. go to these services. So this would be one to watch, but it, but it, this march towards a federal currency, universal basic income, you know, this this distribution of money you know, directly from the Fed to the citizens and not going through the bank. That march is on. Yeah. And regardless of what you think about it, I, I try to, if you, I know that there's a lot of, a lot of accountants, a lot of people who listen don't like the government. Look at how, like the banking system is not any better if you ask me. <laughs> so I'd rather have the government cutting out the middleman by doing this than going through the banking system, which just, they suck resources. They don't add value and when it comes to this kind of stuff. Like that's my philosophy about it. It's the least worst option. So, uh, I have a transition story. Okay. So, uh, a listener, Sandy Lerner, L-E-N-N-E-R, she's CPA and MBA. She sent me an email. She basically said that she's really interested every time we talk about how other people are getting in the accounting space. 
Well, she discovered and sent me a link that the UPS store has a placeholder page that talks about small business accounting and bookkeeping. Now, when you go there, it's really just a 10% discount on accountingdepartment.com. But the fact that you're at the UPS store and they're pushing you accounting and bookkeeping services. Interesting. That's a good partnership for accounting department. And they're one of the largest, uh, one of the OG outsourced accounting firms that's not a traditional CPA firm. Like they've been doing it for 20 years on uh, hosted QuickBooks desktop. And now it's not branded or anything. I mean, imagine if like yeah. UPS tried to brand this and pushed it a little bit, but it, it's straight up just a link to the other page. Oh, like white labeled, like UPS uh, store bookkeeping or something. Yeah. Re- yeah, exactly. Related story. We've been talking about private equity investing in large accounting firms, top 100 accounting firms. The big story in a recent episode was Eisner Amper split their firm into two. They have the audit firm and then everything else is in a private equity backed non-CPA firm now. Huge, big deal. This is a giant change. They're one of the first. There's a couple others that I know of. This is going to have a big impact on the profession. Anthony Zecca is a consultant to the profession, and he's been writing on CPA trend lines about the implications of this private equity deal. Again, like the big, the big aspect of this is that they're taking the, pri- the partner model and they're applying a corporate model instead to the non-audit firm. So this allows the firm, one thing this allows is, is the firm can be a lot more agile because you're not having to deal with a partner model, which tends to be conservative and doesn't want to change a lot. That's one thing. He wrote in a recent article about something else. So this is Anthony Zecca. He gave a, a great example about how this can change employee compensation, staff compensation. And here's the example he gives. He says, let's say you're a managing partner or a practice lead for a good-sized accounting firm, and you need to recruit a international tax partner. And you find a great partner who likes your firm, you offer her equity partnership and a base of 400K a year. She's 40 years old. Talent inter- international, international tax is great. Like you can make a lot of money doing that, right? So she's going to make 400, 400K, but she's also being pursued by a firm that has a private equity investment and they offer her compensation of 400K, the same you're offering, but they also offer her 100,000 in shares or options that she will vest in five years, plus the ability to amass more shares and options based on her performance. All other things being equal, what decision do you think she will make? She's going to take the one where she gets options and equity, obviously. Right, because under the traditional partner model, it might take her 20 years to earn into that firm and get the retirement package and it to get 100 vest per 100% vest in the deferred compensation package in a traditional firm, you might have to be there for like decades. Do you think this but, will help firms retain employees? Well, earlier it's, on and it's going to help the exit? The, it's going to help the PE firms attract employees because now they can offer stock options. They can offer performance-based incentives in their compensation like st- startups do, like like corporations do. So, this is going to heat up the the competition for talent. We've been talking a lot about how this is happening in the pilot world of bookkeeping CAS, bookkeeping accounting pilot, the firm, the, the, the startup offering bookkeeping and accounting and tax services that got investment from Jeff Bezos. I mean, they're not a partner firm. They're a corporation. They offer stock options to people. So where am I going to go? I mean, this is the same dilemma that I had, right? I was a manager at a big accounting firm. A tech company came to me and said, not only are we going to offer you more money, we are going to give you stock options. They're going to vest over four years. And after four years, you want to leave, you get to take those options with you if you exercise them. And you now own equity in our company. The accounting firm couldn't offer me anything like that. They could just say, here's this ambiguous path to partner. Who knows? <laughs> you know, right? there was like no, there's no clear path. So like this is one of the advantages of being private equity based. And so the same thing that we're seeing it's happening- It's more transparent too, right? Yeah. It's just on both sides. And you don't have to sit around and wait for the benefits of being a partner to happen. Like it's it's compressed. There's more there's more short term incentive, and so the same thing that we're seeing happening in the bookkeeping space with Pilot and Bench and Indonero and you name it, Scale Factor, which didn't make it, but same idea. That's going to happen now in the big firms. So it's going to really change our profession. It's going to it's going to be huge. 
So that was my tie-in to whatever we were talking before. I can't remember now. <laughs> uh, hey, talking about CAS, right? Okay, here's something interesting. CAS practices are growing like crazy. CAS meaning client accounting services. That's what CPA.com and AICPA call bookkeeping and accounting. Just accounting, right? It's funny to me that we have to create a term, an acronym, CAS, for the word accounting because public accounting has gotten so far away from what we actually do, what the profession is supposed to be about. <laughs> what is right? actual like, accounting? Yes. What is accounting? Like, like I should say, I have an accounting firm and that means that we actually do accounting. We create financial statements? No. Because when you say you have an accounting firm, people think, oh, you do tax or you do audit. Anyway, so accounting, CAS, the the original- Yeah, where's the regulation on this? We have to talk about all they want to regulate who can use the word accounting, not use the word accounting. Yeah. Maybe that should be regulated. If you don't actually do accounting- Well, that's what Texas tax. does. Yeah. Texas says you can't call yourself an accounting firm unless you're a CPA firm, which- you know, that creates value for being a CPA firm in Texas that maybe I'd want to be one there. Here, I don't need that. So uh, to get to the survey, CPA.com and AICPA did a survey, a benchmark survey. They last did it in 2018 on client, well, they now call CAS client advisory services. So, five so go years, figure. You said 20, five year difference then. Yeah. So it's been a while since 2018. CAS practices saw a 20% growth rate in terms of net client fees per professional. And that's far greater than the 12% growth rate that CAS practices reported in 2018. That was the first time it was done and the last time it was conducted. So 20% is very fast in accounting. CAS is probably growing faster than anything other than consulting. Net client fees for overall CAS practices on average have exceeded a million dollars now. So this is among all respondents, so small firms, big firms, right? So that's that's important, I think, psychologically for a practice, a cast practice inside of a firm to exceed a million dollars, that's psychologically important. Net client fees per client have gone up dramatically. They used to be around 9,000. Now they're closer to 14,000 per client. So we've gone also over the $1,000 a month mark for average client fees per month. Same thing with net client fees per professional. It's now over 100000 per professional, 112000 This is interesting, the uh, fixed fee versus value billing versus time of materials. So back in 2018, about half of firms were doing fixed or value. So it was uh, fixed fee was 40%, value billing was 10%. So half are doing some version of a fixed fee, whether it's value or not. Time and materials was 53%. I, actually, it doesn't quite add up. So <laughs> it doesn't sum to 100%. So I'm not sure what's going on here. But anyway, it was about half and half. In 2020, only 25% of firms are doing time and materials now. You know, 75, let's say 75% of firms are not doing hourly billing. They're doing fixed fee or value billing. Th this is, that's a big shift in just a few years. So that's why I say that the whole debate about fixed fees or hourly, when it comes to how you build a client, that is over. Unfortunately, a lot of firms are still using hours to incentivize their employees and to measure their employees, which doesn't make sense. If you're no longer billing people hourly, why are you using that as a performance metric? It doesn't, it doesn't match up with what's going on. Anyway, separate discussion. Let's see if there's anything else in here. Oh, yes. Also, a lot of firms now, more than half of firms, have staff who are dedicated to CAS only. And I think that's really important to make sure it's successful. You can't just be borrowing staff from tax or audit in the off season. So it went up from 32% to 52%. More than half of firms now, just over that, have staff dedicated to CAS, or as I like to call it, actual accounting. Because that's a year, I mean, it makes sense to have staff dedicated to that because that's a year-round activity. <laughs> yeah, you can't just do it. You can't just drop, you know, bookkeeping during tax season. Like, <laughs> like you're not going to have a good client experience. <laughs> Sorry, we can't pay your bills for uh, a couple months now. You know, you, you take you take over, or, or we're not going to run payroll for you during uh, the month of March. Well, that could be one of those you know? those, those add-on services. Like, What's that? The all you can eat, right? Like, hey, for nine months a year, you get bookkeeping services, but if you want them done these three months a year, you pay a premium. I actually, actually really. Interesting. I never thought of that. 
So basically, I, you're just you could I was be half joking though here, Blake. I don't know. No, I, kind of, yeah. no, I think it could work because that way you could say like, you know, you could utilize your tax people in the off season to do bookkeeping work. But if you actually want dedicated bookkeeping from the cast team, that's not just write up work. You pay a separate subscription for that. So if I don't really need my monthly financials closed January or yeah. you know February and February and March and of April, and I maybe just like put on hold September, and just get October. it all caught up in May. Yeah. Yeah. So write up, you could say like, we include write up for tax purposes as part of our subscription for your tax planning and tax advisory. That's a monthly fee. And and we're not going to deliver you monthly financial reports. We'll just keep that up to date to do the tax return. That could be all inclusive. And then if you want management reports, you pay extra for that. And that's a separate subscription. You got to upgrade to our cast team. Got it. Yeah. So no, this is, that's a good idea, David. See. I don't all. underrate it. Should we jump into <laughs> app news? I think it's time. I've taken up enough. All right. So I have a couple different things. Um, some of it's light and fluffy and easy app news. And then some of it I have to dig into and we can chat chat out some tougher directions that are happening with some companies. So All right. Well, we're going to have to be very focused because we've only got like 10 minutes. Oh, we can do this. No problem. Okay. Let's knock it out. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Baco Tech. Baco Tech is a cloud solution that puts CPAs in the middle of their clients' data by becoming the hub to manage all their clients' information in one single place. Baco Tech gathers clients' data from accounting systems like QuickBooks, Zero, and Sage and delivers it to CPAs in real time, enabling CPAs to make adjustments to tax returns and address client accounting issues as they happen, not after year end. Then, at year-end, CPAs can instantly and seamlessly integrate that tax-ready data into their preferred tax or accounting firm software like Drake, Assert, UltraTax, CCH, Access, and ProSystem FX. This allows your firm to plan and prepare for tax returns throughout the year and allows you to proactively offer advisory services for all your clients instead of reactive planning services after year-end. To learn more about Baco Tech and to take advantage of their special two-month extended trial just by mentioning that you listen to the Cloud Accounting Podcast during your demo, Head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash BACO. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash B-A-C-O. All right, so an article, I saw an article in Forbes, and it's probably like some sort of editor picks, like placed article by their PR company, but it's called Why SMBs Need More Tailored SaaS P- Platforms. And essentially, they were interviewing the founder of an app called Gloss Genius. And uh, so it's the founder, Danielle Cohen Shohet, I think is probably the last name, started this uh, app when she was in college. So, well, in college, she was doing makeup for people. And then when she left college, she got a job working at um, a fintech company and then at a point of sale and then started a, a receipt startup and then started this app instead. So if I'm a hairdresser or a beauty person, I can get this app. People can book my appointments. I can do my payments in that. It spins up a nice website. I can schedule all my employees, right? It's an app to run anything. But what I found interesting about this article was this: some of the mindsets that, that she has, right? And let's kind of quote her here. We believe the best way to support business owners and set them up for success is by offering one solution that handles absolutely everything. The new term for this is business in a box, meaning it's one tool that essentially allows you to launch a business. And kind of thinking of what we were talking about, you know, an all you can eat into it plan where you get your your email, you get your payroll, you get your bookkeeping, or what what app are we talking about added? Oh, toast. We were talking about toast, everything you need to run the business. And I think on paper it sounds really great, consolidating mm-hmm. all mm-hmm. of these problems and coming up with one solution. But then I go to the website and immediately right away I was like, Oh, it doesn't do inventory. Yeah. So so yeah. if you're a hair salon, what do they upsell you to? Product. You can do anything with that in that app. So it, it just sounds so great on paper, this concept of like business in a box. But is it really going to be possible for people to build everything a business needs in one product? No. And that's why they need to make sure that they have an integration. So sure, okay, build out the basic GL or accounting system for a business on your practice management platform. Well, it's not a, a business management platform, whatever you call it, that front office thing. And then when they, when that doesn't work for them anymore because you're missing features, integrate with something else. That's the best of both worlds, right? 
do everything a little bit and then add integrations to help people who can't do everything with your app. That's how it should be. I don't know. That's my ideal world. Yeah, I just feel like the pendulum swinging towards bundling it all. Yeah, yeah but it's it's never going to be that great. Like you said, they're missing the key thing. How, how do you run a salon without having inventory management? You know, like that's like a huge profit center. Which defeats them. the whole value prop of the app, which is yeah. everything in one app. Right. Did you see that Microsoft is shutting down LinkedIn in China? I did see that. Yeah. So they were the last US-based social network, the last major one to operate in China. They have shut down. The press release uses some very nice language, but uh, clearly it's because China wants them to censor and they don't want to do that. Removing access to profiles of journalists who are critical of the Chinese government in the US, that sort of thing. We've heard about this for a few years now. Well, they, they kill the whole feed so, too, right? The feed goes away. It's just like a place for people to connect and share resumes. Or so that's what Microsoft is going to do. They're actually oh, going to the launch- LinkedIn. That would be the best. <laughs> like I would pay a monthly fee for this. <laughs> so, so the China specific version of LinkedIn will have no news feed. It'll just be job searching, no social media features. So you would, you would actually pay for the Chinese version now because it doesn't have the news feed. This would be crazy. Uh, yes, like a LinkedIn light and I could, I'd pay. I mean, that's, that's essentially what they do, right? You pay and then you get to block everybody. Or uh, I thought people paid because then they could annoy people by messaging them with sponsored or paid messages. Or they can't. like if, if but, but at the same time, I can pay and then you can't even email me or get a hold oh, of me. Or, or, I see. It's, or only three people a month can do it. I don't know. You you pay this. It's a ransom on both sides. But uh. I get, And then they need to regulate it because actually on my vacation – I got a text that I knew was from a LinkedIn spammer because, you know, I have a little emoji in my name and that came through the text. So I've been... LinkedIn's the worst. <laughs> so as we all know, October 15th was the extension deadline. So people tend to get a little frustrated on hashtag tax Twitter as the deadline approaches. And uh, it gets fun to, fun to observe as an outsider. And so uh, I, I saw a great tweet from our friend... Laurel and Wilson, CPA, who's been a guest on the show. She said, feeling like choosing violence today, devil emoji. Should private companies such as ENQ be allowed to call en masse to the IRS lines, or is it turning trying to reach the IRS into a, quote, pay to play, unquote, model? Hashtag tax Twitter. And this is one of those services where we talked about a long time ago on the show where they are calling the IRS on hundreds of phones waiting on hold. So that way you use the service and they just, oh, somebody just picked up. Here's a line with two minutes on it. And they just connect you through, they push the call through to you. That type of a service? Correct. It's a digital phone wait in line service. And you pay a monthly subscription as a tax lawyer or a CPA or an EA. So it's like Ticketmaster for concerts. Yeah. I mean, everyone, and thus, thus people either love it or they hate it. You know, it's not like Ticketmaster. No. It's like the reseller. The people services. that get mine at Ticketmaster and, and buy the tickets. And then sell it minutes. to you yes, for yes, more. Yes. Yeah. They're, uh, what do they call them? What's the, there's a name for this sort of thing. Um, and it's like people who buy stuff and then sell it on eBay. Like the people who are buying PlayStation 5s at retail price and then selling for twice as much on opportunistic, eBay. Opportun- they're opportunistic. They're also, I can't remember the word for it. Um, at the moment. It's an economic term anyway. It's when there's a mismatch between supply and demand, these people actually uh, fix it. And so economists actually like this, but your average person thinks this is so ridiculous. This is a ripoff. And so, so, so yeah, what they do is they use bots to dial up the IRS and wait on hold. And then you pay the fee and you can take the place of that bot in line. They'll transfer the call to you. So you don't have to wait. And, and they, they always have, they're always waiting on hold, right? So they've always got one that just got on the line. And the IRS, of course, hasn't figured out how to block this, like the way that some artists manage to block these scalpers. And they the pretend IRS they block the scalpers. Yeah. yeah, or pretend, right? So the IRS doesn't know how to block this. And so this is actually becoming a really valuable service and people are paying money for it and they may like it or not um, because then they don't have to wait for hours online. They can just get access. You pay by the minute with for the service. Anyway, getting back to the tweet, Laurelyn put a survey in the tweet, and it was basically either are you in favor or are you like this is pay to play? And the answer was robo me or pay to play. Twenty one percent said robo me, seventy nine percent said pay to play. So it's not a popular thing. Even if people are paying for it, they're not happy about it. So so the name of the service 
is called the website. I don't even know if I should promote it because I kind of, whatever, you can make your own adult decisions as to whether or not this is ethical. Uh, it's called call N Q C A L L E N Q.com. Uh, I'm curious what our listeners think. Is this wrong? Some people have said on this thread that the IRS should block this and the way they could do it is by requiring you to enter your practitioner number or an ID number before you are able to wait online. How is this already know. not done by the AICPA and the big four and the biggest firms don't have a special number? They just bypass this whole thing. Like It just seems kind of weird that there's really just well, one. Is there really just one number or are there back doors and other phone numbers lo- for people? There's lots of numbers. There's a PPS line. So that's the practitioner priority service. And that's supposed to be for practitioners and not for the general public. But the IRS doesn't have systems in place to make sure that that's actually being used properly. And Jeff Kristoff in this thread said, the IRS should modify the PPS number to require a valid CAF to be entered, would eliminate call and queue, but also everyone flooding it that isn't a tax pro. And yes, currently I pay for call and queue. (laughs) So he pays for it and he has a solution to eliminate it. And Matt Metris said, such a simple solution, there's no way the IRS would go for it. I mean, the IRS could also solve this problem by doing callbacks, where you call, and then you enter your phone number, and then they call you back when somebody's available. Like, you schedule an appointment, basically. Like, there's a lot of companies that do this now. They charge $1,000 uh, a year. Well, the, and the, on their premium plan, yeah. For 4,400 minutes. One of the uh, Twitter responders posted a picture of uh, three different iPhones all on hold with the IRS. That That's one. his solution. That. Yeah, Robert. Robert Gambardella. Anyway, I thought this was an interesting story for App News because it's an interesting solution to a massive problem for tax preparers. Of course, you know my philosophy. Maybe we should just fund the IRS so that we don't have to wait online. That would be a potential solution we should consider. Fund, hashtag fund the IRS. The IRS could just do this themselves. Yeah. They could charge. Yeah. And actually use the money then to invest in hiring more people and stuff like that. Like toll roads, right? Or have a priority line where people pay for it. So, what else we got? Uh, what I have? I have, um, it's Investnet who bought Yodely. So Yodely is basically bank feeds. Mm-hmm. They're um, partnering now and collaborating with QuickBooks to provide uh, more access to more banks. Uh, especially overseas and internationally. Is that so, the story? So if you that's the story. So they're <laughs> they're partnering. So if you don't so if you have a bank you can't have access to because maybe QuickBooks doesn't access it, maybe there's a chance Yodely totally does, and you're just gonna have exposure to even more banks through the QuickBooks and, bank feed. And QuickBooks is they use Yodely? I don't think they use Yodely. Oh this is so in how do you addition get the feed to what into, QuickBooks does. How do you get QuickBooks in so they have an integration with QuickBooks? Well no? that's that's what this announcement is, yes. Oh, got it, got it. They are going to. So so previously Intuit had their own. At right. one time Intuit's was public just like Plaid's and Intuit pulled it back because it's kind of the secret sauce, right? Why do you want – well, in hindsight, they probably should have left it open judging right. by they the size made of Plaid's of gotten, right? Yeah. <laughs> judging by the size of Plaid, they should have probably uh, try to pursue that more. But obviously, they have to build themselves, maintain it themselves. So if they can partner with somebody like Yodely, that's just opening up that many more banks that maybe they don't support yet. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know how the experience will be in product because – it's going to be two different UIs and maybe the UI will just change based on the bank you're searching for to get the connection. But so that, that's just good, right? Any Anytime you can connect to more bank feeds, the better, I think is the best thing on that. We're talking about ERPs, right? We're going to NetSuite, the ERP mm. player. The Sweet World. Sweet World, right? Yes. Shopify announced that they're partnering with a bunch of enterprise res- ERP providers to provide direct integrations via the Shopify app store. Ooh, what what ERPs are they? So we're going to get with? into that. And so the plan is so basically they have ten thousand merchants that use it, their their level of Shopify called Shopify Plus, and these are pretty big brands like Lord and Taylor. And it's going to give a direct connection, eliminating third party implementations. So right now, a lot of people, if you want to connect your Shopify to your ERP, you have to use some third party app. And and I'm I'm saying this like note this in your your head about using a third party app because I'm going to talk about this for within Intuit in a second. So they're going to eliminate these third-party implementations and do direct connections to the ERP solution. So they're going to um, NetSuite, Infor, Acumatica, BrightPearl, 
are going to connect directly to Shopify stores. And very soon, in early 2022, Microsoft, Microsoft Dynamics 365. Wow, they're essential. really going up market. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's definitely up market ERPs, but it's direct integrations, not mm-hmm. using the middleman. And the reason I say that is because I saw another article out this week that Kodat, so Kodat is a middleman app. And Kodat had an announcement, a press release, that they are going I, to partner with Intuit. I've never heard of Kodat. Kodat. Is that something that's... C-O-D-A-T dot I-O. Is it well known? Is it big in our space? Like, um, from right on the to... website, I think they have 33 partners. And actually, um, Melio is using them to connect to FreshBooks and QuickBooks Desktop. Oh, so is this an API company? It's an API. It's a middleman uh, API okay. company. So over here, Shopify's not doing things with the middleman API companies, pushing things to a direct integration. Yeah. Then the other hand, in the same week, Intuit and Kodak are announcing a partnership. Well, this is strange too because didn't Intuit just buy one SaaS not that long ago? Well, they bought one SaaS. They bought an app called in the back in the day called It Does It. They uh, bought the e-commerce company, mm. uh, Trade Gecko. These are all middleman providers, right? And then they have their own. And, and to be honest, like the QuickBooks APIs, QuickBooks Online APIs are incredible. Like there's a lot of the things Zero's adding to their developer platform that are bringing them to, to the equal level of the QuickBooks Online APIs, which are great. And then the desktop SDK has been around forever. It's got 30 years of work on it, right? Mm-hmm. It, it is what it is. So it's just confusing, right? Because here you have one company going away from that model and then Intuit is talking about how they're heading towards that model with an app like Kodak. And so they're going to have a shift in, in the Kodak side of this really plays up this open finance. Like, oh, this is going to open up the finance for SMBs as if it wasn't there already because QuickBooks and Zero have had open APIs since 2013. Open mm-hmm. APIs to the accounting data. Coda had a press release about this. And then actually on the Intuit developer blog, they actually had a post about this, which we missed, but it was on uh, the 30th of September. So Intuit also talked about this integration and they give an example for, because basically with Kodat, the, the, the selling point is if you're building an app, you could integrate with Kodat and you could do multiple accounting integrations all at the same time. For example, it actually says this in, this actually is said in the Intuit developer blog. For example, you can build an app for QuickBooks Online and QuickBooks Desktop via single integration to Kodat. And it so says- this is like the, the, the selling point of Zapier. Right. Kind Same of, idea. Yes, right? Yeah. And you can bring your products to market faster by using Kodak's out of the box link journey to handle complexity of authentication, data mapping, configuration, and validation. Well, if it, if it actually works that way and you can do online and desktop at the same time, that would save so much development resources. So, so this is what's very confusing about this. Intuit tried to do this themselves once. They built, what, they tried to build one API for QuickBooks Online, QuickBooks Desktop. Completely failed. When was that? Uh, before, this would be prior to so November of 2013 is when they announced they were not letting anybody use it anymore and they shut it down. So those three or four years wow. leading up to 23, November of 2013. MuleSoft has tried it. UiPath bought that company, Cloud Elements. Cloud Elements has tried it. Cloud Elements tried to partner with Sage to do it for their five products. Like, hey, well, the one magic API that works across all the Sage products. Over and over again, this is tried, and it's really not a successful thing. I have yet to see it be successful. And so going back to Shopify, they're swinging the pendulum away from the middleman app, and Intuit seems to, based on their blog post here, pushing people to the middleman app, right? They basically are pushing people. The argument is is they're going to actually help possibly approve apps slightly faster if you build using Kodak for your integration. Now, I don't know if this is going to be desktop only, groups online, they're going to push. It's not very clear, but they're really pushing people here to jumpstart their development process by going through Kodak, which I'm really, really surprised because the direct integration for groups online is probably the better way to go for developers. Now, there is one thing in this blog post that was interesting that it said, if you're already using Kodak or considering using Kodak to jumpstart your development, your app will still be required to go through our app assessment process, which led me down another path. So over here, there's this like pendulum swinging one way to, oh, use this third-party tool to integrate with us, because in theory, it'll be more open per se. But 
Intuit is actually refreshing their app requirements process. So if you want to have an app on Zero on the Zero App Store, you have to get like a technical review and a security review. The same thing with the QuickBooks App Store, right? Mm -hmm. You have to go through a bunch of hoops to get your app approved, security, compliance, right? The app has to work. The experience has to be there. And on the QuickBooks side, it was slightly different than the Zero side. It was slightly uh, higher bar to get through to get onto the QuickBooks App Store, but you could still build integrations. So there's thousands of integrations to QuickBooks Online that are not on the QuickBooks App Store. Like maybe, Blake, you have your own private integration. Right, yeah. You have a company, you have three, and you have a custom app. I don't even know, right? In-house yeah, app, yeah, you can do that. custom yeah. app, and you need to connect to QuickBooks Online production data. Starting in November of 2021, any new apps that come on the platform have to go through the security tech and platform assessment process. So even now, if they're one of these private apps? even if it's, it's, It very clearly says all apps in this blog post. So this just wow. came out uh, two days ago, this blog post. And they intend, they want all app developers to be on the updated platform requirements by July 31st of 2022, which is nine months away, basically. And if you don't comply with the criteria, criteria you won't get access to a uh, production credential, which is so basically it's a, the apps connect to each other through tokens and it's a production token, right? And, you, and if you don't pass, they, don't, they only let you connect to fake data, not real, real QuickBooks companies, right? That's kind of the way to think about that, the production. It's like the real key versus the test key, right? Um, they're going to give apps a 30 to 90 day, a 60 to 90 day window to uh, remediate any issues. And then failure to comply result in phased actions. So one, your app users will start seeing warning banners notifying them of the app's non-compliance. Number two, we will limit the app's ability to onboard new customers. And three, we'll block your API access. Is this for existing ones? Existing, uh, existing will have to, they're, they're, existing has to be up to date by July 31st as well. Oh, wow. This is what I'm going to recommend. Our app developers that, list, that listen to the show Everybody who has clients using apps, you probably want to go through and take a look at what apps your clients are connected to. Make sure email addresses are correct because there's a lot of times people will have an app built and that developer moves on. It's a custom app developer, right? right. Who knows yeah. what they email, what email address they signed up on when they created the app or got you your app production tokens, right? With the Intuit developer website. So that's one of the things they say, make sure your developer account has the right email captured. So if any of you have clients that are using custom apps, you probably want to be on top of this and stay ahead of it because the last thing you want is your custom app being turned off. Mm -hmm. Now, with this said, and this is what's so confusing. I've been just thinking about this a lot in the dog park walked, when I was walking the dog today is because it's like a swing of the pendulum towards a closed system. So in the same week, you announced like, hey, we're going to have people try to build faster using this third party app, but at the same time, we're going to lock down the system because frankly, if you have thousands and thousands of apps that connect to QuickBooks Online, not all of them are going to meet these security standards. There's not, especially the one-off custom ones because people are gonna make sure they're secure enough for their own data. If, if there's an app that's made, Blake, and it's not secure, and it's not in the app store, how's it gonna get access to my QuickBooks data if I don't find the app and install it? Maybe this is a response to security threats from hackers. They could create an app, get you to sign up for it, get access to your accounting data, siphon it out through the API. No, and that's definitely the in theory threat that's been there forever. Yeah. But the amount of work involved to create an app <laughs> that looks so amazing, that gets people to install it and then connect it to their QuickBooks data, it's less work just to build an app. <laughs> you know well, what I mean? like, I, well I'm, I'm just hypothesizing here, but you could make an app that looks like another app that uses production tokens and then get people to sign in and connect it. So you could, you could impersonate an you app. You could impersonate an app. That's yeah, correct. Yeah. So maybe that's what they're worried about. But if you're know. not in the app store. But, but if it, I'm not, I'm saying yeah, you, yeah, yeah. You, you would spoof an email. Let's say you, you pretend to be bill.com, right? So you spoof okay. an email that says like, you need to reconnect bill.com. We've gotten disconnected from your QuickBooks. And then it takes them to a spoofed landing page Somebody clicks it, they go, it goes to a spoofed landing page. They put in their credentials to connect. They're actually connecting bill.com you know, fake instead of bill.com real. And there you go. I don't know. That's yeah, just that, a theory. That's, yeah, I think that's it's It'd be doable, edge. right? 
Yeah. Because that, in theory, that should be picked up just by people setting up their developer accounts and getting their tokens at all. Um, I mean, it's definitely possible yeah. that somebody could yeah. do something like that. But then, okay, so now what? They actually get your QuickBooks data. Well, or <laughs> right, like, is, right, right, where, where, you know, now what? Well, then they could go out. They can then they could go out to all your uh, customers. Vendors, yeah, vendors they could try and, to create invoices. Yeah, there's probably right. some things you could. There could be yeah. a trickle down effect of this. But basically, where I'm coming from is you have thousands and thousands and thousands of apps that probably won't be able to become compliant. They're just going to break. So get ready. When is this happening? <laughs> uh, July 31st, 2022. I mean, okay. I, like it's, I just don't know how this is not going to break yeah, yeah. lots and lots of app connections. Or, or it Intuit might have to change this policy. Only right. if, and, and, and that would make more sense, right? If you have more than 10 customers connecting, maybe then you do it. Because yeah. ultimately, and I remember when we first launched the, the platform into it, we used to test every single app like this and we stopped doing it. Right, because it was too many. It was too much work. It was almost impossible. Yeah. And developers yeah. couldn't pass it and they couldn't build the app and they couldn't meet all the requirements. It's a high bar. Mm -hmm. And then if you step back, you're like, who are we protecting? We're protecting three customers that are going to use that app. Right. So it, we're going to see, the, I, this is something to keep an eye on, but like I would probably take inventory of all the apps your clients are on right now and start pinging developers to make sure they're in compliance because I'd be, well, if they're on if, the app store, you can probably safely assume they are in compliance. I mean, you should still... They could be pulled down if they don't meet the compliance. But usually to get, to get on the app store, you had to go through all these higher bar. Right. So the things. ones to watch out for are the, are the ones that are not on the app store. Not on the app store. Yep. Yeah. Those could break. Okay. David, that's all the time we got this week. If our listeners want to connect with me online, I'm at Blake T. Oliver on Twitter. How about you, David? I'm at David Leary, and I'm really a big fan of the new Chinese LinkedIn, if you want to catch me there. <laughs> and if you want to let us know what you're thinking... Send us a voicemail or a voice memo. You can email me your voice memo at blake at blakeoliver.com. Just use your app on your phone, record yourself, send us the message. We will listen to it. We will likely even play it on the air. And let's say you're out and about and that's not convenient. You could also call our voicemail number, 202-695-1040, 202-695-1040. Call us, leave a message. You get a couple minutes on there. We will listen. We'll likely play it on the air. And we always love getting reviews. We haven't uh, talked about it in a while, but I think it's important to remind our listeners that we really appreciate the reviews. David, where should people go if they want to leave us a review? If you're an Apple person, right, side, right inside your Apple podcast app, you can do it. And if you're not an Apple person, you can go to podchaser.com. Just find the Cloud Accounting Podcast and you can write a review there. We really appreciate those reviews. We read them all. We read them on the air. So you can also let us know what you're thinking that way. It really helps us get discovered by other accountants and bookkeepers who you know, want to stay on top of what's going on at the intersection of accounting and technology. With that, David, I'm going to go enjoy Saturday. Enjoy. I'm going to try to go back on vacation for two days. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. Time for the classifieds. If you're looking to quickly grow a scalable, systematic seven-figure accounting firm without having to work 50 plus hours per week, check out Ryan Lozanis' online coaching membership, Future Firm Accelerate. Sign around Ryan's experience taking his cloud firm from scratch to sale so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You'll get online learning and topics that help you automate and systemize all aspects of your firm. You'll get coaching when you need help with implementation. And you'll also join a collaborative community of hundreds of other forward-thinking firm owners. For more details, head over to www.futurefirmaccelerate.com. Hey, podcast listeners, it's Blake, and I wanted to let you know about a new show I'm working on with CPA slash comedian Greg Kite and blogger slash former CPA Caleb Newquist. It's called Oh My Fraud, and it's a podcast all about financial crimes. That's right, a true crime podcast for accountants by accountants. Caleb and Greg are going to come together every couple weeks to unpack their favorite frauds and explore the circumstances, psychology, and interpersonal dynamics involved. They also fully indulge in victim-blaming the defrauded widows, orphans, infirm, and feeble-minded, because who can resist? If you fancy yourself a trusted advisor, or prefer your true crime with spreadsheets instead of corpses, listen to this show to learn what to watch out for and to keep your clients, your firm, and even yourself safe. To subscribe, go to ohmyfraud.com or search Oh My Fraud on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Want to get the word out about your newsletter, webinar, party, Facebook group, podcast, ebook, job posting, or that fancy Excel macro you just created? 
Why not let the listeners of the Cloud Accounting Podcast know by running a classified ad? Hit the show notes for the link to get more info.